With us here this morning as our devotional speaker, a very welcome guest, Elder Marion D. Hanks, assistant to the Council of the Twelve and a member of the Board of Trustees of Brigham Young University. Elder Hanks is married to Maxine Christensen, who accompanies him today, and they are the parents of four daughters and one son. Elder Hanks holds a JD degree from the University of Utah. He is a lawyer and educator by profession and has served as a teacher and principal in the LDS Church Seminary System. He is currently serving the United States government as a member of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. He has been a speaker and consultant at youth conferences throughout the United States and in foreign countries, and has been honored many times for his leadership of youth, including his receipt of the Boy Scouts of America, Silver Beaver, and Silver Antelope Awards for his leadership in that area. Elder Hanks served a two-year mission for the Church in the Northern United States. He's a former member of the First Council of Seventy. He spent a number of years in the leadership of the Temple Square Mission, and he and his family spent several years in England and Europe, where he served as a mission president. He was appointed to his present Church position as an assistant to the Twelve in 1968. Elder Hanks is widely and justly known for his ability to communicate with the youth of the Church, for his stalwart defense of the principles of right, and for his effectiveness as a leader and spokesman for the Church. It's a pleasure to welcome him to this podium today, Elder Marion D. Hanks. <clears throat> I'm here today uh, physically subdued from an interesting afternoon and evening of swinging an axe and pushing a saw in the snow, believe it or not, of Aspen Grove, but uh, built up to an exaltation of spirit and emotion through that great experience. David Grayson wrote, it is not the time of the day, nor the turn of the season, nor yet the way of the wind that matters most to us, but the ardor and glow we ourselves bring to the fragrant earth. It is a sad thing to reflect that in a world so overflowing with goodness of smell, of fine sights and sweet sounds, we pass by hastily and take so little of them. Days pass when we see no beautiful sight, hear no sweet sound, smell no memorable odor, when we exchange no single word of deeper understanding with a friend. We have lived a day and added nothing to our lives. On our way to and from Aspen Grove, we passed hunters, all of them driving slowly and looking forlornly at the hillsides. And I wasn't a bit sorry to see them looking forlornly, personally. Of course, it is a proper sport, I'm sure, and a proper season. I think more of the fishermen, I suppose, who seem to spend some successful time on the river. You may know of the man in Arkansas. I read it in the Arkansas Gazette who went fishing at a place called Lee's Ferry on September 22nd, 1972, caught a few fish and lost his wedding band. As a matter of sore concern at his house, he was so sorry. He went back to Lee's Ferry, September the 22nd, 1973, fishing in exactly the same place, caught a 14-inch trout. While he was opening that trout with his sharp knife, the knife struck something solid. It was his thumb. <laughs> um, well, things, <laughs> things are not always what they seem. Now, I'd like to qualify my being here today. I didn't come for just another meeting, of course. I really feel like the Englishman who watched his first game of American football saw all those huddles and said, 
Seems like an interesting game. I think I could learn to like it, but they hold too many committee meetings. I didn't come, we didn't, to see the local attractions. I was reading the other day about the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was warned about the American news media. Upon arrival, he met a group of these interesting people who asked him questions. One said, Archbishop, do you intend to visit the nightclubs in New York? Warily, he answered, oh, are there nightclubs in New York? The next day, the paper printed the story. The first question the Archbishop of Canterbury asked upon arriving in New York was, are there nightclubs in New York? So uh, I'm, I'm not here to see anything except you, really. And there is one other preliminary to uh, the major message of, of my intent. That is a message, a, a preliminary, which is entirely appropriate here. It came from the Tucson newspaper, known to many of you, I'm sure, and was in reference to a headline published over an article which dealt with a necessary discharge of a number of state employees because of budgetary limitations. The article wanted to know who ought to be fired first, but the headline said, whom shall be fired first. The letter to the editor said, quoting that headline, whom shall be fired first, that's easy. Whom wrote the headline? <laughs> him shall be fired first. <laughs> a him doesn't know enough about English grammar to hold the job him has. <laughs> well, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't come to teach much that's new either, and I'll therefore tell you why I'm here. I came because I like to come, and so accepted the invitation. I like to get the feel of this place. Someone has written, new leaves do not come because old leaves are falling. Old leaves fall because new leaves are coming. You are the new leaves. We look with optimism to your coming, but bid you remember with Charlie Brown that there is no heavier burden than great potential. I came to deliver a nosegay collected along the road, tying together these blossoms with the frail thread of my understanding, acceptance, conviction, and appreciation. And I'd like to say what I have to say, beginning with a quotation from a hero of mine whose name is Abraham Heschel. Gone now, but a great rabbi and teacher. Abraham Heschel wrote, there are two things a man needs information and appreciation. Now, when I look at our educational system and many other institutions for civilization, I see a tremendous emphasis upon information, but hardly any cultivation of the sense of appreciation. Mankind will not die for lack of information. It will perish for lack of appreciation. Unless there is appreciation, there is no mankind. The great marvel of being alive is the ability to discover the mystery and wonder of everything. The real dignity of anything that is, is in its relationship to God who created it. Unless we learn how to revere, we will not know how to exist as human beings. For what information, since it's very important, and appreciation shall we seek. Let me share a story you may have heard, and if so, we'll appreciate the more, but for those of you who have not, it will be a thoughtful experience, I think. An older man and a fine young man were on a broad river in a rowboat, drifting. 
talking. They had newly become friends. The old man, as they talked, the older man, picked up a leaf from the surface of the stream, said, son, do you know very much about biology? He said, I'm afraid I don't, sir. Well, he said, you've lost 25% of your life. They went a little farther, and he, the older man, took from the bottom of the boat a rock, held it up, examined it, talked about it a moment, and said quietly to the younger man, son, do you know very much about geology? He said, a little embarrassed, no, sir, I'm afraid I don't. He said, you've lost 50% of your life. Smile. As they drifted, it became dusk, and the first evening star appeared. The older man said, son, do you know very much about astronomy? He said, I'm embarrassed to tell you, sir, that I, I don't. And he said with a smile, you've missed 75% of your life. They drifted a little longer, and then, sensing some unusual current in the water beneath them, looked upstream and saw coming at them a huge wall of water from a dam which had burst. The young man said, Sir, do you know how to swim? And he said, No, I'm afraid I don't. He said, You're about to lose all of your life. <laughs> a leaf, a rock, a star, swimming, biology, geology, astronomy, yes, yes and swimming too. It's wonderful. It would be wonderful if each of us had a broad enough base in the laws of nature, and the basics of science, the facts of history, the principles of philosophy, to be interested in and understand in a measure the great advances being made around us. This contributes to life and perhaps to making a living. But more important than any of them, central to all of them, giving them all meaning and coherence, is information and appreciation of man himself, of his relationship with others, with God, of his understanding of origins and heritage, possibilities, responsibilities, and an everlasting future. Let me look at two or three matters of appreciation selected out of a multitude I've been turning over in my mind the last few hours. Appreciate life. Grayson's comment about ardor is complimented for me by something I heard from two wonderful psychologists, a husband and wife team, teaching a group of adults a long time ago. Out of all that they said, much of which I remember, one thought is foremost in my mind. Nor heaven nor hell can him surprise who loves his home and loves the rain and looks on life with quiet eyes. You may have heard the last interview recorded with Dr. Tom Dooley before he died of leukemia, after having given the young years of his medical career when he could have been in social circles making a lot of money, to the people of Indochina, the great nation divided into many nations whose names we're familiar with. These are the two or three sentences that constituted the valedictory of sorts of Tom Dooley. Said the questioner, Dr. Dooley, you are living on borrowed time, yet your contributions to humanity seem to take no account of the trials you personally are called upon to bear. Yes, he said, and this was replayed the day he died. I am living on borrowed time. So are you. So is every man who walks this earth. I may live to be as old as you are now, sir. I may not live to see my next birthday. This does not matter. What really counts is what I do in terms of human good with the days, the weeks, the months, or the years the Creator has allotted me. Appreciate life. 
appreciate others and be respectful of their values. I was called on to speak at a public, or to pray at a public gathering a time of, ago and found myself without premeditation thanking God for the qualities of gentility and civility and tenderness which permit people of diverse points of view and diverse ways of living yet to be together in an atmosphere of courtesy and graciousness. I've thought about that since. I think the Lord blessed me to say that. It certainly was consonant with how I feel and what my life would like to represent or I would like it to represent. Do you remember the words of the great apostle who encouraged all of us to honor the brotherhood and honor the king and honor all men. In this other book we read, the prophet under the inspiration of God preceding some marvelous words we know very well, beginning with let virtue garnish thy thoughts, preceding those words with the admonition that we are filled, that we be filled with love for the brotherhood, which is appropriate, and all mankind. The message is repeated again and again. I wonder if we always are sensitive to it. Do you know the story of Mike Gold? I confess I didn't until a year or so ago. Mike Gold, as I hear of it, was a communist in his early life in depression or soon after times. He grew up in a ghetto, not knowing it. As a little boy, he was circumscribed by four streets beyond which he could not go. He didn't understand what that meant. He found out, or began to one day, when as just a little fellow going to school, he was accosted by a group of boys. Hey, kid, they said, you a kike? He said, I don't know. He'd never heard the word. They said, where do you live? He told them, they said, ah, you are a kike. Well, you're in Christian territory, buddy. You're a kike and you killed Jesus. We're going to show you how we feel about that. So they beat him up. He went home bruised and bleeding and bewildered. His mother took him in her arms kissed and cleansed him and said, Mikey, what happened? He said, I don't know. She said, who did this to you, Mike? He said, I don't know. Years later, when he had now come to write his book and tell the story, he recalled how sitting on her lap, he had looked up into her face and said, Mama, who was Jesus Christ? I read from the Book of Mormon. Now, my brethren, I've spoken unto you concerning pride, and those of you which have afflicted your neighbor and persecuted him because you were proud in your hearts of the things which God hath given you. What say ye? Of it. Do you not suppose that such things are abominable unto him who created all flesh, and the one being is as precious in his sight as the other, and all flesh is of the dust, and for the selfsame end hath he created them, that they should keep his commandments and glorify him forever? Do you remember Shah's Pygmalion? The difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves but how she's treated. And when I think of Mike Gold and of Jacob chapter 2 from which I've just read, I think of another sentence from Abraham Joshua Heschel. Oh, please get its meaning. Holocausts, he said, are caused not only by atomic explosions. Holocausts are caused whenever a person is put to shame.
Appreciate your own special spiritual heritage and values. I read in a wonderful Christian Protestant magazine a little while ago a somewhat strange and to me sorrowful statement. Like all other institutions of liberal Protestantism, this magazine is suffering from an erosion of self-confidence. There is a pervasive feeling that we no longer have anything particularly distinctive to offer by way of religious insight. In this world where the Lord needs every strong heart and devoted hand and tongue he can find, I think that's very sad indeed. What I'm saying to you is that we need to appreciate the special heritage and values which have come to us. Let me just say a few words, and if you're willing to get in on this in a situation where I cannot ask you to speak what you're thinking, will you think, though for a moment, what particularly distinctive insight the kingdom of God offers you in these matters, God, Christ, man, life, sex, marriage, family, resurrection, eternity, and I named some others for each of which I have citations. I had the blessing of reading again early this morning. Conservation, pollution, liberation, population, elections, freedom, abortion, governments, Christ. In these and a multitude of very important principles and programs and doctrines, matters, there are distinctive, special insights. But just knowing that or hearing it doesn't really suffice, does it? We must learn them and learn to act on them and become converted to them, really. I wish there were enough time to tell you all the details of a conversation I once had with a young lady, a lovely person who was professionally qualified in an important specialty. I would not want you to know those details. So I simply tell you a headline. She was about to make a decision which would influence her and her generations. Came into my office reluctantly because both she and I love her parents. She not really interested in anything I had to say and acknowledging that. She acknowledged it openly when I asked her. We had a little time and so we talked. I said to her, when did you last do any serious reading about the church? She was leaving it behind. Oh, she said a bit blithely, in the ninth grade we studied the Book of Mormon. I quit, though. I said, did you also quit praying and going to church? She said, yes. And pretty soon you stopped living the life, yes. I said, I really just have another question to ask you. I think I've said about all I want to say. There is little virtue in pleading with you or trying to admonish or teach you with the attitude you now have. So I'd just like to ask you a question about something else. The church office building over there is about ready to be completed. All those many stories. Your specialty will be involved in its completion. I'd like to do what I could to get you the job to work on that great big building. Would you like that? And she, looking a little dubious, said, well, I, well, sure. I said, all right, I think I can do it on one condition. You perform your professional specialty in that building on the basis of what you knew about it in the ninth grade. She looked a long time at the floor before the tear dropped, and she said, Oh, Brother Hanks, I'm in terrible trouble. Can you help me? To learn and then to act. I know a man, again, only a headline, but I'd like you to hear, who as a bishop won an award for his great skills and success in training teachers who worked in ghettos. When it was all over and he had his award, some of his fellow teachers who knew him and knew the quality of his character and the nature of his life and his attitude toward his fellow men uh, said, uh, 
We just don't get it. <clears throat> How can you, being a Mormon, do the kind of work you do? He said, you really don't get it, do you? I do the kind of work I do precisely because I am a Mormon. Well, much more I'd like to say, but I simply invite you to appreciate your own particular distinctive heritage and the religious insights which it offers. I have to add, I stood under an awning one day, low in spirit, soaked by the rain. I had a bunch of law books under my arm and they'd been soaked. There were a lot of other problems on my shoulders, problems of the care of people I loved very much and demands made on me and many church assignments. I hardly knew where to turn and I really was depressed. There were two others under the awning uh, whom I did not at first even notice, but I couldn't not hear them speaking to each other. One said, and she was very near the birth of a child, a beautiful person, to her friend. How are things going with you? She said, just fine, but we can't find an apartment. Have you found one yet with a baby coming? I oh, said, this beautiful pregnant girl, we've we found one. She said, you did? How, how could you? We've looked and looked. Oh, she said, we did too. Bob and I looked and looked till we were exhausted and then having done all we could, we fasted and prayed for a couple of days and he went out and found a nice place. Oh, said the other. And I stood feeling ashamed, remembering some things I hadn't even thought of for a while. Appreciate the importance of being humble. Do you remember the wonderful line, Yea, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief? Do you remember the wonderful line about matters of greater consequence, weightier matters, the Lord called them, judgment, mercy, and faith? Do you remember the wonderful man who knew how to treat his neighbor, who knew how to love God and his fellow man? He wasn't a member of the kingdom. The Savior said to him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. There was something else he had to do, but he had the spirit and the meaning. And do you remember the Pharisee and the publican, the one self-congratulatory over his religious exhibitionism and the one who would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven but smote himself on the breast and said, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Out of literature a long time ago, I extracted a sentence I hope I can remember. A young priest about to leave his calling because he saw injustice, an older priest encouraging him to remain because he saw true Christian strength in him. He said to the younger man, you have inquisitiveness and tenderness. You are sensible to the distinction between thinking and doubting. And best of all, you do not have that bumptious security which brings from dogma rather than from faith. In the name and worship of Jesus Christ, we should be humble. Two other suggestions, and I'm through. Appreciate the responsibility of being an individual in an organized society, a person and a social being with responsibility to others. Avoid, I pray you, that lone eagle complex that makes some people say, it's my life and I'm going to live it. I'm going to do what I want to do in spite of what it does to anybody else, what effect it has on anyone else. Do you remember Niemöller's interesting bequeathment? He who got along for a long time with the Nazis and finally was imprisoned. These are his words. They came after the Jews 
And I was not a Jew, so I did not object. Then they came after the Catholics, and I was not a Catholic, so I did not object. Then they came after the trade unionists. I was not a trade unionist, so I did not object. And then they came after me. There was nobody left to object. 600 years before Christ asked at the end of a story well known to all of us, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? 600 years or more before that, Jeremiah had asked, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Appreciate, please, the need we all have to keep the pledges we've made. Sister Hanks and I were at the tomb of Gandhi in India. We read there a few words that I have treasured since. Words about pledges, words that I have found mirrored in these books and my own covenants and the memory of them, reflected in the little piece of bread and the cup of water we take on a Sabbath. Gandhi said, there are some things I must not and will not do even if my life is at stake. I will keep my pledges. I remind you to be grateful for the pledges and appreciate them. I exemplify them in an experience I had. Again, a headline, I would not be willing to have anyone identify a fact. In a small town, I had to talk with a lovely young woman about an opportunity she desired and now felt ready for, one which she would have not enjoyed because she disqualified herself for a time at least. We were talking about whether it now could happen. She was candid and humble and gentle and forthright, anxious for her great opportunity. When we finished, I said to her, who else knows about this problem way back then? And she said, my bishop and stake president and my parents. I said, and I have more often felt blessed by the Spirit to ask a question than in answering them. I said, what was the reaction of your parents when you told them? She said, my father put his arms around me and wept and said, Ah, oh, sweetheart, how could you endure this heavy burden alone without us to help you? I said, Was that his first response? Was that his reaction? She said, Yes. I said, Do you know how blessed you are? Could I have the honor of meeting your father before we leave here? The arrangement was made. I took him by the hand and looked in his eye and said, if I could express in my own life the maturity of Christian understanding of the gospel light that you have, I would be very grateful. I bid you remember that, please. That's a good place to stop, save one, and that one's a scripture. To have that kind of commitment, he was a bishop and a very good one, and that kind of mature understanding of what it's really all about, and that kind of love, oh, I see that as an appreciation of what God really expects us to grow to and is pulling for us to accomplish. Now I bid farewell unto the Gentiles and unto my brethren whom I love until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ. Then shall you know, wrote Moroni, that I have seen Jesus and that he hath talked with me face to face and that he told me in plain humility, even as a man telleth another in mine own language concerning these things. And I join, Mor join Moroni in this invitation. Now I would commend you to seek this Jesus of whom the prophets and apostles have written that the grace of God the Father and also the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost which beareth record of them may be and abide in you forever. This is his work. I think 
to learn of it and appreciate it is the major undertaking and the highest blessing of us all.